Well, I thought about it. That ice on top of the cover that made me think. No, I thought I probably ought to reconsider this. my mom if she stays out any longer she's going to owe me a million bucks I think so I think so yeah yeah I think so yeah oh, yeah yeah it's hard to believe isn't it yeah good morning how are you today oh Hey, Hayden. Hey, Hayden. Can you get that door for me? Thank you. Good morning. How are you all today? Good to hear it. All doing fine. I'm glad. That's always a good way to start the day. Fine. Uh, it's hard not to be fine with that sun shining so bright. Uh, Brett sent me a picture this morning. Um, our sun is still behind the trees. It's that way until uh, oh, another few months, I think. And uh, after another few months, <clears throat> it will be um, clear of the trees and then we'll be able to see it. I always rush to say to Brett and to my mom, I saw it first, but um, it was real easy to do that with my mom, but Brett, he gets up at two in the morning, so it's a little hard to do that with him. Um, but the uh, sun so bright this morning, so beautiful and uh, exciting to see that. And uh, when I finally saw it about 15 minutes after you sent me the picture, there was this big ball and you could see it coming through the trees. It was just as beautiful looking that way. So, amen. But it makes such a difference to wake up with the sun shining. 
Doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. On the way in in the morning, I typically send <clears throat> oh, 10 or 12 pastors a good morning. Um, God bless you in your preaching today. And uh, and they usually respond right away. The ones that are still sleeping don't. Um, but um, so the ones that are were sleeping are now texting me saying, "Well, thank you very much, Amen." Uh, well, we had uh, prayer requests last week uh, for a, a gentleman in West Virginia. Uh, he's recovered, doing much better, and brought him out of the coma. Uh, so he's doing a whole lot better. So thanks for your prayers. I know. The family appreciates that. Still has a long way to go, but uh, good progress. <clears throat> so uh, this local United Way office realized that it had never received a no donation from the town's most successful lawyer. Uh, the person in charge of collections, good morning, um, and contributions called him to persuade him to contribute started the conversation. Our research shows that out of a yearly income of at least $500,000, you do not give a penny to charity. Wouldn't you like to give back to the community that you work in in some way? The lawyer molded over into his mind for a moment and then he replied, well first, uh, did your research also show that my mother is dying of a long illness and has medical bills that are several times her annual income. Embarrassed, the United Way rep mumbled, uh, 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 no. And then the lawyer went on. Or that my brother, a disabled veteran, is blind and confined to a wheelchair. The stricken United Way rep began to stummer out some sort of a, an apology, but was interrupted. Or that my sister's husband died in a traffic accident the lawyer's voice raising in indignation, leaving her penniless and with three children. By this time, the United Way rep was completely beaten and simply said, I, I had no idea. On a roll, the lawyer thought, I'm going to cut you off again and say, and if I don't give any money to them, I'm sure not going to give any money to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what makes humor humorous? It's so true. <laughs> it's so true. Uh, that's a, that's something. All right. All right. Well, enough folly this morning. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for our time today. Uh, Lord, uh, laughter doth good like a medicine. Thank you for giving us just a little bit of medicine this morning before we get started in our study. Uh, help us, Lord, to focus on the study. A lot of uh, details and a lot of history. Sometimes that can really um, get kind of boring. I pray, Father, that you breathe life into it, make it uh, living to us. And we'll thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And we're in between verses 13 and 17. Revelation chapter 2 in between verse 13 and 17. And um, we, we've been talking about this period of time. Uh, again, just to show on the, the board up here is uh, the seven churches in the book of Revelation have a literal significance. They existed back in John's day. Uh, they have a doctrinal slant and it's mostly Jewish and it's slant. And as a result of it being Jewish and it's slant, it has a faith and works based connotation to it. The Jews, unlike the church, the Jews always had a conditional relationship with God. It was always God said, if you do this, then I'll do that. The church does not have that. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. There isn't anything in the Christian's life that God says, if you do this, I'll do that with regard to eternal destiny in heaven. Jesus paid the whole price on Calvary's cross. When he was finished, you remember his last words? It is finished. Okay, it's all done. 
No conditioned on it. If you accept Him as your personal Savior, you don't ever have to worry about that ever going bad. Because it's not based upon you or your performance before you accepted Him, nor is it based upon your performance or your obedience after you accept Him. Everything is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. I'm saved eternally, not because I'm a good person. I'm saved eternally because of the grace and mercy of God. He accepted me just as I am, without one plea. And He said, if you'll confess me as your Savior, I'll confess you as my son. The, the Old Testament Jew and the New Testament Jew doesn't have a relationship like that. If an Old Testament Jew or a New Testament Jew wants that kind of a relationship, the Bible says they cease to be Jew. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, but Church of God. So when a Jew now accepts Jesus Christ, their personal Savior, they lose their national identity and their identity is changed to church. They're a part of the body of Christ. They're a part of the church. So they, they lose that relationship that is very obvious in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament was always covenantal. It was always, if you do this, God said, then I'll do that. Uh, I'm so glad I don't live under that. All right, because man, I mean to tell you, I'd be in trouble every five seconds. Amen. You don't have to say it; I'll say it loud. <laughs> Amen. If if my salvation was based upon my performance, I would lose it every five seconds. Because it's not just what I do; it's what I think. And it's not just what I think; it's what's in my heart. And the Bible's already declared: the heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And then this exclamation statement afterwards, who can know it? <laughs> you know, it's like you can't even fathom how dark the heart is. So if my salvation had anything to do with my performance, I'd lose it. But the New Testament Christian, the body of Christ, doesn't have that kind of a relationship. The relationship is the gift of God given, gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But the Old Testament Jew and the Jew coming where God is going to come back and restore them, they always have a faith works relationship. Always. And you can look at these two scriptures and you can see it. The Old Testament's first, Deuteronomy 6.25, where it says, And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all that is written. That is conditional. They have no righteousness unless they do what the Old Testament law said. And the Old Testament law, the beginning of it is the Ten Commandments. But if you've read through Deuteronomy and, and Leviticus, there's a whole bunch more to it than just the Ten. All right? That's Deuteronomy 6.25. James 2.20. James chapter 1, verse 1 says, To the twelve tribes scattered abroad, greetings. Who's the twelve tribes scattered abroad? The nation of Israel. And in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 20, it says, Wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. They always have that relationship. It's always covenantal. Always. And so when we get to the book of Revelation, where the primary doctrinal focus of the book of Revelation is to the Jew, because the book of Revelation is to reveal Jesus is coming back. And so that's to the Jew right here. See that right there? That's Jew. And so the uh, book of Revelation's doctrinal focus is on the Jew. That's the reason that we see when we're going down through here through the seven churches, it says, if you overcome, see the condition? If you overcome, then I will. That's always covenant. And anytime you see that in the Bible, you know that there's a Jew involved in the process because that's how they related to God. When John the Baptist came on the scene, which we look at as the beginning of the New Testament, what did he ask people to do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Come on down. The kingdom of heaven is hand. Come on down. And so that's what they were doing as a nation. They were repenting. Covenant. They, they wanted God back. They knew He would not do it unless they first repented. And so that's what that was all about. All right. So when we get to the book of Revelation, these seven churches... We see it doctrinally. We'll, we'll see it all through the first three chapters. Then there's an application, and that's what we spent the most of the time with, is those seven churches represent the total, the grand total of church history till Jesus takes us out by the rapture. 
And so we're looking at them from this standpoint, more of an applicational than anything else, is how does that, what do we see church history that brings itself so that we can understand what happened all along and how these churches describe each one of them. So we looked at Ephesus already. We went through Smyrna. I don't have anything written up here, but if you wanted to write something in that box, if you're taking notes, it would be persecution. Man, they were, they were just, they were grind, ground in a meat grinder. They just, it was terrible. If you ever want to see the heritage that gives us the right and privilege to sit in a comfortable padded chair in a conditioned room of heat and cool in our full bellies and anticipating what's going to happen in the service where we worship the Lord, the people that paved the way for us to have this privilege did it with their blood and the bloods of their kids and the blood of their friends. That's this church right here, Smyrna. Myrrh. Myrrh. Terrible calamities. I mean, what took place there? And right after that persecution, which is where we are now, Pergamos, represents a period of time between 325 and 500 A.D. after the death of Christ. And this is when the church got tired of being persecuted and they married the world. So, that's the reason the Bible is real clear about the Christian, our lives. You don't have to look like a freak, okay? And a lot of Christians interpret being separate from the world as looking like a freak. You don't have to look like a freak, all right? Being separate from the world means you don't buy into that system, that you don't act like that system, and that you don't look for that system's acceptance. So you can still work, you can still go to school, you can still do whatever you do, and come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord. That's the command. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Kind of what we were talking about this morning, Brett, is that sometimes the family looks at you as though you're weird. Every time that happens, <laughs> I go, well, praise the Lord, it's working. <laughs> Amen? I mean, that shouldn't be something that makes us sad. That should be something that says the people that are closest to me are going to notice it the most. That something's changed about me. And what is it? That I'm self-righteous? You know, I don't smoke, chew, or go with them that do? No, that's not what brings us as separate from the world. What makes us separate from the world is when the world wants to do sin, we want to go the other direction. When the, the world wants to speak a certain way, we speak a different way. When the world longs for things, we long for different things. When the world is interested in being accepted, we say to be accepted by Christ is more important than being accepted by anybody else. So that's what makes us different. And that's what was lost here in the Pergamos period. The Pergamos period, the saddest time in church history. Everything that was given to us here in Ephesus through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was lost here in Pergamos. Just a thin thin thread of the truth made it through from Pergamos all the way to Laodicea. Just a thin. What we have today that we call church isn't anything akin to what it was when Jesus left this world and the Apostle Paul began the church. We, uh, we, and we'll get to that when we get to Laodicea. It describes this pretty well, unfortunately. But for right now, we're at Pergamos. Pergamos means married to the world. And what happened during this period of time, as we've talked about, is that um, when Christianity, through Jesus Christ, began to populate itself from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world, right? Acts chapter 2. All right, be witnesses me in Jerusalem in Judea, Samaria, and the other most part of the world. If you can think of circles like this, all right, kind of like a sound wave, you know, here, 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 here. That's what he's saying. Start here, Jerusalem, then Judea, a little bit bigger, Samaria, a little bit bigger, and then the uttermost parts of the world. As it began to just grow throughout the world, um, 
the, the Roman Empire, which controlled the politics of the world at that time, was in direct contradiction to Christianity. And so Rome's way of dealing with that is extermination. They just exterminated him. Get rid of the problem, then you have to deal with it. But they found out in Rome the same thing that the Pharaoh found out in Exodus when he tried to kill all the babies. Remember, the more that they persecuted him, the more they what? Multiplied. And the same is true here. And so in about 313, right in here, in between these, about 313, an emperor came on the scene named Constantine. Constantine, 306 to 327. And Rome politics was involved in paganism. They adopted every false belief of every country they conquered. They just assimilated it into their belief. And as a result, when they were in, in politics control, they were the most paganistic, barbaric people and super superstitious. And what Constantine did is he said, if you can't destroy them, if you can't exterminate them, what you do is you invite them to the party. And so that's what he did. He said to their kids, uh, you know, we'll give you a tax credit for your kids, we'll give you tax credits for your family, we won't persecute you anymore, and we'll let you be involved in the church. And they said, really? And they said, yeah. And we'll, we'll even, we'll meet you in the middle. We have this holiday, you have your holiday, we'll let you have your holiday, you just move the date to our holiday. And then you can worship like you want to on our day. But you can call it your day. And that's what happened. As, that's the marriage to the world that took place. And this, ma this marriage between paganism and Christianity is what we now know as the Roman Catholic Church. Now, please, I always try to make this clear. We're live and we have a lot of folks that listen to us. It's not our desire to say, you know, we're, we're best and we're good because we're Baptists. I'm not talking anything about Baptists. That's a denominational name. All right. How in the world would you know where you lived if you didn't have an address? So, Baptist is our address. That's, it's called First Baptist Church. That's our address, okay? They say, where is that? Oh, it's right across from the library. Everybody knows where the library is. And uh, so, that, that's our address, all right? Baptist does mean something, but it's been watered down so much, there's, it's worse than Heinz 57. There's a bunch of them. And they all have a little bit different tweak to them, okay? That's our address. I'm not talking today about our address, denominational name. I'm talking about the truth of the Word of God. I have a lot of folks that are in Baptist churches that are filled with heresy. But I love them to pieces. The people are fine. They're just misguided. The ones who teach it are the wolves in sheep clothing. But the people are wonderful. And the same is true with the Roman Catholic Church. There, there are so many wonderful people within the Roman Catholic Church. I, I have no grief. I have no complaint with them. I have, I have just sorrow that they've bought into a system that is so wicked and pagan. But I don't have any beef with them. So for those who hear me, just so we don't misunderstand one another, and for those online, I have no beef at all with Roman Catholic Christians. Uh, uh, people who, who go to that church. Uh, my beef is not with them. I would say to them the same thing I'd say to my Baptist friends. If you die without Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, not by what you do with Him on a daily basis, but what you did with Him at a day and time in your life when you realized you were a sinner and that you were going to die and go to hell in your sin and you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it doesn't matter what your address is. It doesn't matter what denomination you are. If you die without Jesus Christ, your Savior, you die without hope and without God. And my plea is not for you to be Baptist. My plea is with it you come to know Christ, your personal Savior. That's the, that's the only thing. But history is history. Now, if you Google history, you're not going to get what I'm saying because they're going to give you this history. 
and they, they get all their history from him. Uh, by many, both Protestant and Catholic historians, this guy was a great Christian. But anybody that knows more than just to take someone's word for it and reads what he believed, you and I would know, based upon the Bible, he wouldn't know Christ if he met him in the street. <laughs> He'd walk right by him, looking for him. Nothing he believed ever pointed to a knowledge of personal relationship of Jesus Christ. All right? So, we can throw that out the window. That's a really nice story time reading, but it's not truth. The truth is, is he was a pagan who found a way to absorb Christianity into pagan politics and from it developed a great political religious system known as the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not trying to be unkind, just being honest with truth, with history. All right, so all this took place and of course, in order to propagate a lie, you have to change history. That's why you see what's going on in the world today of tearing down monuments and isolating different groups as hate groups and building up other people that are oppressed. All that that you see is about changing history. If you rewrite the narrative, your generation, my generation, we're going to know the truth, but guess who won't? the generation that comes after us. So that's what they did. They, they go about rewriting history. Well, where's the history of the church found? In the Bible. <laughs> so what are they going to do with the Bible? They're going to change the Bible. And it was during this period of time that people who had embraced Jesus' ministry and I think had accepted Him as their Savior uh, became involved in this marriage with the world and realized that they could get great acceptance and applause through education. The Bible's real clear about education. Nothing wrong with education, all right, if it's the right education. But you have to be careful of those who ever learn and never are able to come to the knowledge of truth. And it's always centered around, and you want to memorize this verse, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Go ahead and turn there. Colossians 2, verse 8. Every Christian should memorize this verse. When the Bible says, beware, <laughs> uh, that's like, you know, just before you fall off the edge of the uh, uh, Grand Canyon, beware of your feet. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, you should probably take notice of that. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Whoever gets that, just read it out loud, if you would. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Thanks, Sarah. And you read it so loud. I appreciate that very much. So those online can hear us. Beware lest any man spoil you through what? Philosophy. 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 All right. Philosophy is human reasoning. Philosophy is uh, uh, Aristotle. All right. Philosophy is after you listen to them, you go, I have no idea what they said, but it, aren't they smart? Okay. So you, you're, you're wild by them. You think, that's amazing. I don't even know what they said, but it sounded so profound. All right. That's philosophy. All right. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, through vain deceit, after the traditions of men, and not after Christ. So the education that's important with God is after Christ. Christ. Where are you going to find anything about Christ? In the Bible. Amen. That's the reason the Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the reason he said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's the reason the Bible says that he hath exalted the word above his own name, Psalms 138. That's the reason the psalmist said, Let the word of my heart and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. That's the reason Psalms 119. How many knows that's the longest chapter in the Bible? Psalm 119. 
What do you read in every verse of Psalm 119? The Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word. If you want to be smart in this world, you don't do it through philosophy. You do it by reading that book. If you read that book, instead of hearing and listening to people tell you what they think it means, you let the Spirit of God guide you and show you what He means, you'll be the smartest person on the earth. I remember standing one time with a bunch of people that they were educated so high uh, they couldn't sharpen a pencil without breaking the lead. Uh, I mean, they were, they were very intelligent people. And uh, they came up to me one time and they said, why are you so quiet? I am not in their group. Just so you understand, I, yeah, they, they really were. They, have a very, they had a very high IQ, all of them. They all knew it. If you didn't know it, they'd tell you. All right? They had a high IQ. All right? And I was in there and I didn't. And so they finally come in and say, why are you being so quiet? I said, even a fool when he shuts his mouth is considered wise. And they said, that's profound. <laughs> that's amazing. They were ready to give me my credentials to join their group. And they said, where did you come up with that? And then I blew it. <laughs> I told them, <laughs> I, want anything. I said, that comes from the Bible. Proverbs, it's the wisest man that ever walked this earth apart from God himself. Uh-huh. And boy, they like cockroaches when you turn the light on, man. They took off. So, so, but I'm saying that the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. But the wisdom of God is where we need to be. And that's the reason it's so important about this. But what happened is there were some people that realized that the world doesn't think like God thinks and that the more education one gets, the more recognition they get. And then if they get around a bunch of educators together, guess what? They start a little uh, a fraternity. It's the fraternity of educators. And guess what? I say, after Frank says some profound thing, I repeat it too. After Mr. Frank said this, uh, uh, he made this statement, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. And Frank says, well, thanks for scratching my back. So he goes to the next conference, and he says, now as Mr. John Young said uh, this, said, I agree with him 100%. And the next thing you have, the whole fraternity agrees with everybody. <laughs> That's how it works. And so this fraternity that started did not start in Antioch in the Bible. Turn to Acts chapter 11, verse 26. What's so significant about Antioch? What is so significant about Antioch? Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Go ahead and just read it out loud. That's the first place they were called Christians. All right. Now, so that you understand the context of Acts chapter 11, this wasn't... Oh, yeah. Say it again, Sam. Okay, that's not how that was. That was like we would say, you're ugly. That's what they... You're Christians. You know why? Because they were like Christ. And they're like Christ. You know what they did to Christ, remember? They hung Him on a tree. And so in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, people that started looking and acting and behaving like Christ, they said, oh, you're a Christian. So if you want to know where the birth of the church that God wants us to know about began, it's in Antioch. Antioch. That's an important thing. But the philosophers who wanted to impress the religious and the political uh, arm of the day came from Alexandria, Egypt. Alexandria, Egypt. There was a university there. And one of the guys that had recognized Christ and I think had in his own way accepted Christ went to this university in Alexandria, Egypt and his name is Origen. And Origen became a master at philosophy, Eastern religions, and he took the Bible from Antioch and he made changes in the Bible in Antioch to fit his philosophy of belief. And he was Gnostic. Remember I told you last week, a Gnostic is someone that believes in a greater God and a lesser God. Two gods. God the Father, 
the greater God, Jesus, the lesser God. That's a Gnostic. Okay. And that's the reason that every Bible, since the Bible that originated in Antioch, which if you have an authorized version, that's the version. Every Bible since then has all of the corrections that were made from Alexandria, Egypt. That's the reason in John 3.16, the word begotten is taken out of your Bible. That's the reason in Matthew chapter 1, verse 25, firstborn is taken out of your Bible. That's the reason in your Bible, if you go down through and you have a Bible other than the authorized version, there'll be big chunks of verses missing. It's because it was all, all happened right here in this period of time. They, they did not want Jesus to get the due that He was. They had a Gnostic belief. There's a greater God and there's a lesser God. And they had denigrated Jesus to being the lesser God. And they were bound and determined to change the Word of God to reflect that view. And because it has so much of what every other Bible has in it, we would say, and especially because they changed the vows and the these to you and me and the yees and the yeas and all that to more modern language, everybody said, this is so much easier to read. And it sells. And people buy into it in ignorance. They just buy into it. Well, yeah, it is a little easier to read. And I just want to make this statement. The Bible is not understood by how easy it is to read. It's understood by the Spirit of God that's inside you. The Bible says He bears witness to the truth. And I'm telling you what, I've never ever had a problem with the these and the thous in the Bible. Ever. I have to take a dictionary with me every once in a while because what, W-O-T, I didn't know what that meant. So I looked it up. Guess what? Now I know. All right, conversation. I always thought it meant something you say, and I looked it up in the dictionary and found out no, it's not about what you say. It's about your manner of life, and it reflects the truth of the Word of God. Right, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Conversation is about who you are, not about what you say. So it's, it's interesting. So I've never had any problem. I just. Every once in a while, I have to take a dictionary. Now, to be honest with you, I was reading this textbook the other day. Very, very boring textbook. And I had to use the dictionary with it, too. Almost all of us have to. I mean, unless your vocabulary is off the chart, all of us have to use the dictionary every once in a while, or we just act like we know what it means. Or we take the context in which it's given, and we think, okay, I assume I know what it means. But um, a dictionary is not a bad thing to have, and uh, it'll set you straight. Now, with the authorized version, it's, not, it's good not to get a modern dictionary, because they, you know, they, modern dictionaries like this. Man, that's really cool. Not that it's cold, but it's far out. Not that it's a distance away, but it's really neat. Not that it's folded nice, but it's awesome. I, I mean, don't get a modern dictionary. By the time you're done, you won't have any idea what the words mean. But go get an old English dictionary, 18, uh, 1848. Uh, 1828, whatever it is, of uh, Webster's Dictionary. Have you ever seen any? Has anybody ever seen one of those? Yeah. I've got one in my office, it's a big one. That's a big thing. You open it up, it gives you the definition of word, and under it, it gives you about five scriptures to look up an example of where that's used. Now, that's interesting. Take that to Harvard with you. That'll be good. Okay. So, at, at any rate, um, the, the marriage of the world, that's what took place here in Pergamos. All right. Now, I've given to you all these bad people, we've talked about them, that, that broke down, sold out uh, from truth, and uh, they bought into philosophy. Uh, but let me give you, there's some others, Bible-believing Christians <clears throat> who uh, were from that Acts 11 verse 26 area. Uh, one of the names is Ignatius, I-G-N-A-T-I-U-S, Ignatius. Uh, he lived around 107 uh, A.D. Ignatius is from Antioch. He was a close friend of John who wrote the book of Revelation and the book of John. 
He pastored the church there in Antioch, Ignatius, I-G-N-A-T-I-U-S. Later he was brought before Trajan, the Roman Holy Father, who passed sentence against him for heresy because he preached that Jesus died, buried, and rose again. And uh, they, com- they sentenced him for heresy and commanded that he be transported to Rome from Antioch to be tortured there. It's very unusual. Usually they didn't spare the expense of transferring you. They just kill you right on the spot. But he wanted to make a, he wanted to make a, 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 a scene and he wanted to make a statement with um, <clears throat> Ignatius. And so they sent him to Rome. And uh, it's interesting. This just gives you a little idea of the character of these people. With unusual boldness, Ignatius said he would, quote, pray for the beasts to be ready for him and that he would go up and pat them if they didn't get aggressive, end of quote. Speaking of the lions, I'll pat them. He was placed in the Colosseum and was ripped apart by lions before a watching and excited Roman audience. That's Ignatius. The chair you're sitting on, he paid for that with his life. You remember the song that we sing? Um, Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while other thoughts to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend to God? I mean, these songs that we sing that we may not know the origin of are from these times. These were people saying, it's not, it's not right that Ignatius should die for Christ by himself. I want to too. <laughs> Those of us say, where's the back of the line? <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't want to get up there in the front. They might pick me. But not that this, this group here. This is a completely different group. We have Ignatius. We have, uh, and I don't have time to go through all these, and you probably wouldn't want to know anyway, but great things to study. Lucian, 312. A.D. and Christom, uh, Christosom, uh, 345 A.D. These these were just a few of the the men, and there were women too that during this period of time uh, paved what we know today with their blood. It was an amazing group of people, and they all had their origins around Acts 11:26, Antioch. So Constantine makes peace with the church at the end of the Smyrna period. And there are three things that stand out about the end. And I, I want you to take note of these um, because this is really important. All right. Number one, an outbreak, outbreak of heresies in opposition to the Word of God by philosophers and scholars. <clears throat> what happened during his reign, um, uh, Constantine, is that to the church... There was an outbreak of heresies. A heresy is an, a false belief. So during this period of time, we have what we call today baptismal regeneration. That's where someone thinks that in order to be saved, you have to get water baptized. All right, That, that water baptism isn't just a picture of what's happened, but that's when it actually happens. When you go down the water, you get saved. All right, That, that heresy came out. Um, uh, the, that heresy now is taught in Church of Christ, Christian churches, um, uh, uh, and the like. That the names of these addresses, like Baptist, they describe the beliefs that are in these churches. A Christian church or a Church of Christ, these are typically churches, and there's some Baptists in there too. They're, these are churches that believe that you get saved when you actually get baptized. Okay, that heresy came out there. Uh, there's the heresy of Gnosticism, a greater God and a lesser God. All these, and there's many of them, they all came here. Uh, the, the heresy of believing that you can lose your salvation if you don't live it. All that came in this period of time during the marriage of the church. And that there was this opposition to the Word of God by philosophers and scholars. Number two, a large number of martyrs dying for their faith. This is what happened at the end of Smyrna, at the beginning of Pergamos, and all the way through Pergamos. 
Number three, a rising number of men who took on the title of church father, like a patriarch, who begin to think and teach that they are more authoritative than the Word of God. They institute a church, a religious hierarchy, that becomes the authority instead of the Bible. I'll give you an example. The Bible is real clear. Call no man on earth in a religious context. Call no man on earth your father. In a religious context, call no man on earth your father. And we reject the Word of God and we believe someone that tells us otherwise. All right? I'll give you another example. Um, Thou shalt not have any other image before you, idols. Disregard the Bible. It doesn't know what it means. It's okay to put it in your front lawn. It's okay to stick it on the dash of your car. It's okay to carry it on your key ring. Now this is this is this this is this thing is that the church system becomes the authority rather than the Word of God. Now I don't want you to just think it's them. Baptists are and they're one of the greatest as a group. They're just as bad as any of the other denominations. They got a bunch of stuff in it. Must have got it out of the Bible because it sure isn't in it. <laughs> that kind of thing. Okay. So. One of the things that earmarks First Baptist Church, probably more my ministry in First Baptist Church, is I'm not interested in what anybody thinks or what anybody says or what anybody has said. I'm only interested in what God said. That's it. <laughs> All right. If it, if it flies in the face of what somebody's been teaching that's wrong, they're wrong. What does the Bible say? Let God be true and every man a liar. <laughs> it's, not, it's saying God... Word is truth. And that's what I have always tried to bring to any group of people I've ever been involved with is I'm not interested in the party line. I'm interested in only what the Bible says. And this is what happened at the end of Smyrna, the beginning of Pergamos, and all the way through Pergamos is the institution, the religious hierarchy became the authority instead of the Bible. And as I said, it's known as the, by the name of Roman Catholicism, a religion of ancient paganism which was married to Christianity. John MacArthur, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he's uh, uh, very uh, prolific in writing and has a large church out in California. Uh, I quote him in this point. If you look for an example at a period of time, say from the year 70 to 600 A.D., which was under Roman Empire, and then around 312 A.D., under the direction of Constantine, now here's the important part, heathen priests became Christian priests. Heathen temples became Christian churches. All children were required to be christened. They were therefore supposed to be made Christians by putting a little water on their heads. Heathen days of feasting and drunkenness were made to be Christian days like Christmas and all other sorts of saint days. Christianity got lost in all of this. It was merely a mass state religion. And that is perhaps the most dominant period in the church history when the Pergamos mentality was evident. The church, God's body, never recovered from this period of time. Oh, <clears throat> what we have today has a semblance, has an appearance of, and, and I hope here more so than other places, of what God intended His church to be. But man, it got lost back here. Terribly lost back here. So now you ask someone, are you, are you a Christian? And they say yes, and you have no idea what that means. But in Acts eleven twenty six, they knew what it meant. <laughs> but today, that you don't have any idea. Ask anybody walking into Walmart. Are you a Christian? Oh yeah. How do you know that? Well, I try to be the best I can. Oh, okay. 
Are you a Christian? Oh, yeah. I go to such and such church. Oh. Oh, I see. Um, hey, are you a Christian? But well, yeah. <laughs> Why? You think you're right and I'm wrong? I, I was just asking. I was just asking. Yeah, I'm just asking. You have no idea what someone means when they say they're a Christian. Someone asks me if I'm a Christian, I say, well, Hallelujah. Bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. I received Him as my personal Savior. I'm on my way to heaven because of the grace of God. You have another question? No, no, that's plenty. That's I'm fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not interested. Not interested. Well, this all happened right here. And that's the reason I've spent so much time here, just to pinpoint where Christianity went down the sewer hole. And it did it by marrying compromise. That's the reason the Bible says, come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord. That, that's the reason. Because every time Christianity tries to impress the world by being like the world, they always lose. Always lose. So he wants us to do that. All right, next week, Lord willing, <clears throat> verse 12, we're going to talk about the sharp sword with two edges. The sharp sword with two edges. Now, as we move along in our study of Revelation, you say, we studied Revelation? <laughs> uh, in our study of Revelation, as we move along in that, there'll be less of this. All right. But you have to have a fa foundation, and that's what we're doing. Okay. A good, solid foundation. As we move uh, away from chapter 3, for the Laodicea church, that's the last one in chapter 3. As we move away from that, then we're going to get in the nuts and the bolts. I'm going to give you a little teaser so that, you know, entice you to come back. Is how many times, well, let me ask you this first. The Gospels are about the what? Hint, hint, hint. The first coming. The book of Revelation is about the what? Hint, hint, hint. You guys are so smart. Okay, the second coming. How many Gospels were written about the first coming? Matthew, Luke, John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Four. When Jesus comes back the second time, how many times do you think He's going to tell you about how He comes back? Four times. What most people do is they look at the book of Revelation as scope and sequence. You know, chapter 4, come up hither. Chapter 22, the end. And that it's all sequential. But in the book of Revelation, what we have, just like Jesus did with His first coming, He shows us His second coming four different ways. Vials, trumpets. There's four of them. And people get it all mixed up because they try to say, okay, this, well, this seemed like it already happened over here. I don't know if you've ever read there before and it says, I think that happened over here and I, 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 that's what it is. It's four times the first time, four times the second time. He just doesn't call it the Revelation uh, first, the Revelation second, the Revelation third, the Revelation four. He just figures that you're smart enough to realize if I told you how he's coming the first time four different times, guess how many times I'm going to tell you I'm coming the second time? four different times. All of them a different view. There's some things in Matthew that are not in John. There's some things that are marked that are not in Matthew and Luke. They all gave their different opinions and their views of what they saw. Same thing in the book of Revelation. So again, I'm just trying to entice you to come back because I know you may not want to. But I want to make sure that you have a reason to come. It's an exciting study. We'll get going into that. And we'll hear about all the slam bam boom <laughs> that happens in the tribulation. It's so exciting. Amen. You know why? It's not bad when you see all those helmets and those shoulder pads beating each other up out in the field if you're comfortable in your seat in the stands, all right? Or at home watching it on television, you go, those fools, who would ever run full blast at someone else who's running full blast at you and then go Ugh! afterwards like they did something? You know, that's kind of stupid, all right? But here we are sitting in the stands and we're watching it unfold before us in the book of Revelation. And I mean to tell you, it is all out, slam, bam, boom. And it'll be exciting. So I hope that you'll stick with us as we go through this, this beginning. This is us. This is the church. It tells us a lot about us. Let's pray.
Father, thank you so much today for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to spend it together here. And uh, Lord, so much information, some of it may be new to those that are here, um, haven't heard this before, and I, it's so hard to put it all together. I pray that each week, Lord, as we build upon each thing, that you will give clarity to it and an understanding. Lord, we love you, but we don't know what love is before you loved us first. And uh, the love that we see demonstrated from you. And then those followers early on who gave everything to follow you. I, I pray that it would inspire us, your love for us, their love for you, to fall in love with you as well. Not just with words that we say that are nice little cliches, but by the actions that we take with our life of what we do. We'll give you praise. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much. God bless you. See you in about 20 minutes for the morning service.